that I mean, I guess, okay, if, if some of the ethical issues were brought up and discussed earlier in the film, then they could get further. But the way it is, by the time we reach the end of the movie, there's really not, like, Doug gets a, a positive, you know, a happy ending because he's the protagonist. And, you know, it was unfair if he was supposed to pay, or if he was supposed to, like, go to prison for life because someone else took control of his body. But if, if the simulations are still there, then that's still incredibly unethical. I guess maybe the ending should have been that they talk about how to be more ethical with it. Yeah. And the credits roll over a pop song, like I, I don't know, the, like called the Cardigans, Erase and Rewind. I mean, The Matrix, it's Rage Against the Machine, which I forget if, is that punk rock or is it a different subgenre of rock? I'm not sure. I don't think rock music, any kind of rock music would have fit for this. I'm not entirely sure pop does either, but I, I mean, it falls on the, it, it comes right after this very happy ending. So I guess that's a way to, yeah. And the movie is an hour and 33 minutes without end credits and 36 and a half with them and that brings us to the next section notes taken before watching so let's see Yeah, so I really appreciate the exploration in this movie of how it would affect the ethics of seemingly good people if they could live life without consequences, i.e. in the case of this movie, is in a simulation. Armin Mueller Stahl and David both become, Hannon and David both become very selfish people who act out on their worst impulses and yeah so spoilers for the matrix and existence which to reiterate i 100 percent love i stand them i stand them hard the following is not a criticism of them those two movies don't really do that all that much although near the end of existence it does pose the idea that if you spend a lot of time in a very realistic simulation you might end up having trouble distinguishing between that simulation and reality, you might do things in the simulation that if you did them in reality would be horrible. In the Matrix, human beings are being used for basically slavery, but there isn't really anyone taking over human bodies and, well, you know, agents, but we never see a person like, wake, I think in maybe Enter the Matrix, maybe we do, but you know, in the, in the movie, we don't see what it does to someone. And again, I'm not saying it, sh it should, that we should. But it's one of the reasons I think it makes sense to also have this movie and not only those two. But, but yeah, you know, taking over human bodies, forcing us to do things against our will, and then after they're done, we just don't remember what even happened. I mean, that is a very creepy and disturbing idea. I think one of the single scariest ideas is to lose control, for someone else to be in control of you. And let's see. And I will grant that in The Matrix, the heroes kill a lot of people because they realize they're potential agents. Ah, excuse me, I need to sw swap fingers. And the, you know, The Matrix doesn't really acknowledge that that is a very messed up thing. We're actually supposed to cheer them on as they gun down dozens of human beings who are actually slaves to a machine. Don't get me wrong, I love The Matrix, I will always love it, but I'm not going to make excuses for that aspect of the movie. I saw someone years ago suggest that they could have been armed with non-lethal weaponry. I have to agree with that. Well, I guess I don't have to, but I choose to. And... let's see... 
Yeah, and it's very interesting that the movie confronts Doug, who's so proud of having created simulation, not thinking about what it does to the people who live in it, with the fact that ultimately he is also living in simulation. I do understand if some viewers feel that it's then a cheap way to get a happy ending that he gets to leave his simulation, but then it is neat that at the very end of the movie it's like a simulation ending. And it's like, you know, is the simulation that final reality we see? Is it our reality, etc.? I suppose one could joke that the best moment is right at the end of the film, but it's not because the film is out, itself is over. I love The Matrix, and I definitely understand the popularity of the idea that the protagonist is the savior of mankind that will end everything negative about the simulation. And let's see. But I do kind of love that this movie doesn't really have that exact thing, and let's see. Yeah, actually, yeah, I wrote here. The, I'm not sure the movie itself is asking us to think that. I can't help but think these simulations are going to keep corrupting seemingly good people. I could maybe grant that 2024 uh, Armin Mueller Stahl, uh, let's see, Jane and Doug won't create another horrifying simulation, but you know, there are still thousands out there, so some of those might be corrupting people as well and yeah the movie really doesn't say yeah so no more spoilers for matrix and existence unless i warn again ultimately the movie doesn't really engage with that idea that the the thousands of other simulations the line about how there are thousands basically serves to tell tell Doug you know there's yeah it ah, what's the word one second it yeah it it exists to tell Doug that there are a lot of these but that his is unique and he is unique in that they manage to make a simulation of their own. And I think that is also, I think there's like a, a scientific paper on that or something that if you created enough simulated worlds, eventually one of them would become complex enough to itself develop the technology to make, to make a simulated world. I agree that it's perhaps too much of a clue right at the start of the movie to, you know, Doug has a bloody shirt and blood on his sink. I don't think that it's a plot hole because David doesn't care if Doug ends up in prison for murder. He wanted the character, you know, he wanted, like, the, the idea is to prevent more people from realizing that they live in a simulation, and if Doug is in prison for murder or executed, then he's also not going to realize the, you know, at that point, Whitney is the only person left who knows, as, as far as we see in the movie, I guess, it's, realistically, there's probably like a team of people who worked on this, but, you know, the movie needs to, to not get into the, the, how, you know, that kind of opens up a, a whole new can of worms, doesn't it? Anyway. And let's see. Yeah, David wanted the characters dead that had or might might figure out that the that nineteen ninety nine is actually a simulation. So using one of them to kill the other, it's two birds with one stone. And let's see. So basically, the love story comes down to that. What does that say? Yeah, uh, Jane and Doug. Yeah, Jane was in love with David, and Doug and David 
look alike and apparently are similar personality wise even though that's not how it works in 1937 simulation actually to, to be fair that's that's they talk about how the 1937 you know that's not the less like it's it's an early you know they're not it's not perfect so maybe that is and and I mean that is also kind of no wait no because Natasha Molinaro is very different from Jane so yeah anyway I think again just they, they didn't really think about that and we're not supposed to think about it either I guess but yeah they you know they were in love Jane and David were in love so Jane falls in love with Doug because Doug is like what David used to be like so it's a sort of soulmate I need you in another life type of romance and you know I don't personally I don't have a problem with love stories I I'm not personally in love with the whole you know soulmate I need you in another life type of romance but I you know I don't think there's something wrong with loving those and Sometimes when I say there's, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, I feel like I need to offer up an example. Well, I don't think the relationship between Mickey and Mallory and Natural and Born Killers is anything to emulate as far as romantic relationships go, for example. Like, if, if I was really in love with a girl and she was like, we're just like Mickey and Mallory, that would upset me. That would not be something that I wanted to, yeah. But soulmate, you know. Let's see. But yeah, the my girlfriend's. I, now I feel the need to specify. I never had more than one girlfriend at the same time, but. I don't think they thought that it was a soulmate kind of thing, and I didn't really think of them as a soulmate, although we, there were, with, with my various girlfriends, I had a lot in common with them, but, yeah. Now. Yeah, so I guess the idea is, I mean, they say in the movie, go somewhere that you've never thought of going. I guess that's supposed to mean that there is some sort of, like, they the, like they put the thought in the head of everyone in the simulation that they don't really want to leave the, the town or city that, they, that the simulation is of, I guess. And then there are the roadblocks. And, you know, most people are not going to drive through roadblocks. And they're not going to try to drive around them either. So I guess that's... But yeah, that's the thing. that Some of the time... Some of the concepts in the movie, they didn't completely do all of the intellectual legwork to, to get all the way there. And it's, it's unfortunate because they went... They got a lot of the way there. But yeah, and the definitely, for sure, the movie... The, the ending is very... Roland Emmerich and I've seen a lot of his movies most of the time when a Roland Emmerich movie ends with like a happy ending it fits that movie you know the movie felt like it was leading to a happy ending anyway but with this one it just doesn't 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 isn't yeah It's a pretty clever idea that people in the future created a simulation so intelligent that without their control, the people in that simulation became smart enough to, real, to create a simulation of their own, which of course led them to realize that their own world was also a simulation. And let's see. I saw at least one person asking why would Hannon leave the letter inside the simulation if it was for Douglas who is outside the simulation I think the idea is that he didn't want anyone except Doug to know 
and almost no one outside the simulation no, you, you know which simulation I'm talking about, has a chance to use the simulation. You know, like, literally, there are three people that we see that could go into 1937, the simulation, and I don't think Whitney... I don't think Hannon was worried that Whitney was just gonna go in there and, like... Wait a second, now that I think about it, that's almost kind of genius. There are three people who could go into the 1937 simulation. Hannon is one of them. Doug is another one. And the third one is Whitney slash Ashton. So he leaves the letter with Ashton so that if Whitney went in, he, he couldn't talk to someone about it. That's actually kind of clever, yeah. Because he's not... Because if he asked the 1937 Armin Miller stall, he wouldn't remember. That's actually very clever, yeah. So, so yeah, I, I really think that's the idea, that if he, if he left the letter, he wouldn't have to change the words of the letter, but if you, because we, you know, Ashton repeats a lot of it. So, hypothetically, if, when, ah, what's it called? What's it? Right on the tip of my tongue. If when... Thoughts are going a million different directions. I gotta, I gotta latch on to one of them and ride it. Let's see. Hypothetically, if... You know, he, he left a message on Hannon's... On Doug's answering machine. And he was going to talk to him in person. But if he couldn't... You know... I think the an the answering machine message was going to tell him. Wait, did it tell him to leave the me that he left a message? Something like that. He thought pe someone's going to come and kill me, but they can't access the simulation, and I don't want anyone outside the simulation to know. I mean, he legitimately didn't realize that the people in the simulation sim sim were smart enough to realize that they, you know. Yeah, he di he didn't think that Ashton was going to because he wasn't thinking of Ashton as a person, same as he wasn't thinking of the the young women he slept with as people, or otherwise he would have felt bad about it. If he wasn't going to feel bad about it, why wouldn't he have sex with women in the real world or what he thought was the real world? You know, so yeah, it you know for sure. It is something where for a while you might wonder about it, but I don't think it's a plot hole. And, and you know, I guess you can argue it's convenient, but ultimately he really didn't think that it would cause any problems. You know, he thought that he would be able to... And, and again, it is, you know... We, please tell me we're not gonna, like hate every single piece of fiction where in like it's it's a it's a very useful device it's a very useful plot device to have a character realize something hide a hint as to what they discovered before they're then killed which they knew would happen and that's why they hid the clue that it, it works really well you know if you didn't have the letter you know how do, how would how would any of it even have... Why would Doug enter the machine if he didn't think there was a letter there for him? <clears throat> and... Let's see... I've seen some criticize that the major characters don't seem to care what circumstances their double is in. In, in the simulation is in I feel that this underlines the way that the, the this underlines the fact that they really don't think of them as people you know they they act like they can just like like it's a like it's taking the bus or something you know you just what you just you, you enter the bus you show the ticket and then you you take it to your stop and then you get off you know that's basically how they're treating 
because they're not thinking of them as human beings because they made them and they were they didn't make them to be human beings they didn't mean for them to be as intelligent and and it is also please do note that literally <laughs> i think every single time someone enters a simulation in this they have limited time to accomplish what they're there to accomplish and they try to enter it when it would work well for them not necessarily you know even jane when she comes to comes to you know takes over natasha molinaro even she does it while natasha is at work which you know happens to to john at one point as well and I think every single time someone enters the 1937 simulation, something dramatic is revealed or happens or something. Like, the first time... Let's see. Yeah, the first time when Armin mueller Stahl exits it, for one thing, it's dramatic if you don't know the concept going into the movie and you don't know that this was a simulation for another right after he gets killed. And, and and we also, we see him go to a bar, and it's like, this is why he likes the, the simulation, because he misses what things were like in his youth, you know. And and that is, you know, with, with this kind of thing, you have to answer the question, why did someone make the simulation? Why did someone clone someone, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And many times, it's the, the answer is because it was useful, or... Because they wanted to use it for something evil. But here, it seems legitimately like he was nostalgic. He missed the way things used to be when he was a kid. And he made... You know, I mean, it's it's essentially like... it's if, if Stranger Things was a simulation instead of a TV show, you know? It's... it's yeah, ev everyone likes nostalgia, which is kind of funny because what we don't really think about but apparently like originally that word means pain from an old wound but now we talk about nostalgia like ah oh, i love nostalgia like it's so nice when i remember something from a child but that's not what the word is supposed to mean at all which is really funny anyway sometimes i find things funny that not everybody finds funny it's funny like that and the the yeah so the yeah, so that's the first time that the simulation, and then the second, you know, the second time we see the simulation is Doug's first trip in there, and he realizes that Hanman was sleeping with young women in the simulation. Then the second time he goes in there, he gets into the fight with Ashton, and almost drowns, and then Whitney goes in there, and dies, and Ashton takes over with me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then David takes over Doug, kills Ashton, and almost kills Jane. But then McBain kills Doug. No, David. So Doug wakes up in 2024. So yeah, the every single time something ex you know something happens. That's yeah. So I watched some YouTube videos. The alternate ending, it's five and a half minutes, and the very end of it is the same as the regular ending. It's just that after waking up in 2024, there's maybe two or three minutes, I didn't time it, where it seems like Doug is trapped in there. It's, and it's like this, it kind of looks like a dungeon cat. Like, obviously, if he woke up and in, in 2024 the way it is in the movie, even if he was alone, he wouldn't freak out. But in the alternate ending, it does look kind of like a dungeon. And, you know, he's like yelling for someone and he's like, you know, banging on the door. But then after two or three minutes, you know, Jane does show up and we have the happy ending. We just, we don't see the, uh, what's it called? We don't see the, the you know, we get a brief, we, we briefly see what 2024 looks like and it's, you know, the, the sun is out, and there's, like, a beach, and there's, like, futuristic buildings off in the, in the distance. You know, you don't quite get that in the, in the alternate ending, but it is still a happy ending. He's not going to be in jail. 
and the trailer does actually show a little of the a little footage from the from the dungeon. So, you know, I some people must have been confused. I, mean, I, I just wanted to very briefly comment on, you know, in in the review itself, I I talked a little about the effects. Now I can spoil. Basically, every time there's a comp very like an an effect. A visual effect in this that really has to stand up to scrutiny they put it in the distance in the background for example the the 3d grid you don't get a close look at it even, even when he gets a close-up and he says you could call it the end of the world I'm almost certain we don't see the 3d grid there because it wouldn't hold up to scrutiny and the the future futuristic world also no close-up of the buildings they're off in the distance and yeah, but yeah, if you if you're interested, I recommend watching it. And the Lucid Nightmare has a review of it. That's good. And let's see. And, hmm. Yeah, one of the, I'm sorry, I, I just know it's called the 13th for a movie review, and it's 13 minutes. I'm really not, I, I don't remember who the uploader is, but, you know, maybe you can find it by that. He points out, why does Doug feel sure that he's in reality at the end of the movie? You would never stop feeling like you're not in the real world, and it's like horror. And... He says, like all good sci-fi, brings up more questions than it answers. And, right, and he says, the cop at the end doesn't go crazy when realizing he's in a simulation. He just wants to go on with his life. Because to him, that is reality. And, yeah, so I watched the, the trailer. It's two, min two, two minutes and ten seconds. I've always really loved this trailer. I guess today I can admit it's just pretty good. It's not amazing. It also does perhaps spoil a little bit too much. Like, it literally has, you know, you have the, you could call it the end of the world. What did you do to the world? Turned it off. And, and yeah, there's, there's too many. There are too many things like that. And the ending with, like, techno music really doesn't represent the movie. And then there's a 2 minute 33 second fan made trailer. Excellent. Honestly, way better than the official trailer. And let's see. Yeah, and there was also, it's not really a trailer, it's more of a TV spot, but I found it by searching 13th floor trailer. 31 seconds. It's fine. It's nothing mind blowing. And. Yeah, and there's a five-minute interview with Craig Bierko. Before the events of the movie, Douglas never questioned fate and true love. And he didn't look at the 1937 stuff before filming. Sorry, yeah, he, the actor, didn't look at the 1937 because that way he would be, you know, his, his surprise at what it looks like would be real. And he said that Gretchen Moll is beautiful, talented, a rising star, kind, and it comes through in her performance. And let's see. Yeah, and there is a commentary track featuring the director and the production designer. And let's see. Yeah, I'm just going to say some of the things he said. Douglas is clearly surprised by the blood on the sinking shirt at first. The audience is learning it at the same time that he is, so he sympathized with him. They reshot some early scenes to make sure Douglas was likable. And in 1937 scenes, Craig looks and sounds like Douglas Fairbanks, which, yeah, very true. And they dub some of the lines when Douglas leaves the simulation, and he asks where he is, they tone down the acting of it, and they have the they have him smoke to show that he's not himself, and 
Christian Mould was cast because of how well she auditioned as Natasha, not Jane. She completely understood the role. Or, or yeah, whatever. Something like that. She completely understood the role, you know, plays it like white trash. And Armin Mueller Stahl told the director not to have waitresses in 1937. Cigarette girls and dancers, but no waitresses, because that wouldn't be period accurate. And the fighting by the pool, there is no padding when Craig get, gets knocked into the pillar. And Gretchen was perfect as N Natasha. She came out of her trailer already chewing gum, which was her idea, not the director. He actually hates gum. And the director didn't think he needed the shot at the of the end of the world. Douglas seeing it, Roland Emmerich convinced him. So I don't like that many of Roland Emmerich's decisions. I don't like very many of his movies. But that's, I'm sorry, that is 100%. You definitely need to see what the the grid looks like. 100%. It's in, yeah. It, the movie would be way less if we didn't see it. And the director says he learned a lot from both Roland Emmerich and Dean Devlin. They shot Doug talking to Fuller's daughter after he sees the end of the of his own, yeah, of 1999 simulation twice, once on a rooftop with rain. It became too much of a romance thing. Hence why in the movie it's not on a rooftop with rain. And they got a week more of shooting off Roland's money and rather than the, the backers. So, so the director felt especially like he really has to make this count. And Fuller's daughter and Doug are so in love. The whole film is about two people holding on to each other in a scary world, which, I mean, if that's the, the way you see it, then for sure the, the ending makes a lot of sense. They almost took out D'Onofrio in the car because they felt that it wasn't necessary. When Ashton, yeah, anyway, but they thought his acting was so good that they left it in, and Yeah, and they say that, you know, Whitney thinks it's a joke, and then he gets hit by a car, and the simulation consciousness takes over his body. It's not a joke. This world has rules. And the last scenes almost come right out of the original book, which was written seven years before the first microchip came out. So he was really ahead of his time. Yeah, see, I could see how that's maybe why the last scenes feel so... It's, they, they don't fit with a lot... There's a lot in the movie that they don't fit with, so they were it was maybe too close of an adaptation. And apparently, the novel has some 1984 stuff. The, the novel, not the year. And they say it's shocking when Doug, sorry, when David kills Ashton. They didn't want want David to just be evil. He's jealous. He wants to possess. Jane, he can't stand not controlling her. I, I think they did fine on that. He is fairly one note, but it works. And we do know that it is jealousy. She says it, he says it. And yeah, he sells it. And yeah, so when Doug wakes up in the future, Gretchen isn't certain yet that he's Doug and not David, but she sees in his eyes that it's him. And they liked ending the movie on the simulation shutting off. So, yeah. And, yeah. The the DVD also comes with a trailer, and it's the same. Has the music video for Erase and Rewind. And it, yeah, it's fine. I, I don't review music videos. And, yeah. There's seven seconds of conceptual art gallery. 25 seconds of before and after special effects comparison. And it's mostly uh, digital compositing. And 30 seconds of talent profiles. It's just what they've, what other movies they've done. You know, 1999, IMDb and Wikipedia weren't a huge thing. So you could call it special features just to list the stuff someone had been in. And that, oh, one second. That brings us to the final section. 
which is called Critic Sites, MDB, and Wikipedia. And let's see, 145 individual notes. So here we go. Yeah, so this is one of the professional critics that they're quote, the film starts strong presenting a captivating scenario, then somewhere in the second half dips into a sappy romance. Yeah, hard to argue with. And the movie works, and yet it fails to be a great one because of the dissatisfying last hour which gives us predictable twists and atrocious conclusions. Hard to argue with that. After a slow start, this becomes more interesting with decent character development, despite obvious plot holes. See, I don't necessarily think they're plot holes, but... You know. The roles are underwritten. I mean... Yeah, maybe... And then he goes on, they go on to say, and especially in D'Onofrio's case, overacted. Maybe some of it. A stylish but overplotted and ultimately a logical combination of sci-fi sci mystery and romance. Overplotted. Yeah, yeah, true comes off as little more than a holodeck adventure from an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, only with better production values. I wouldn't go as far as saying that. I I think it does some things that those don't, but I'm not going to start spoiling those. Hmm. Huh. Yeah, I... Yeah, okay, I'll just briefly say, I'll just read this aloud and say I completely disagree. I haven't seen a film in the last 20 years that has such bad lighting and poor choice of film stock. I don't know. I, th I think they did a really great job on that. A marvelous film right up until its inappropriate ending leaves you feeling betrayed. Yeah. Apparently Rotten to the on Rotten Tomatoes, like what's it called? The the yeah the Rotten Tomatoes summary was basically that you know it was confusing and I don't know I mean maybe see again I'm not certain. Did I watch this in 1999? I don't, I'm not 100% certain when I watched it, but it was not, it wasn't that long. Again, for sure I had watched it by 2007. I think I watched it before 2003 and just didn't write a review back then. Yeah, so, okay, so the, the, one second. Let's see. I've never had trouble following the plot, even when I watched it back in 1999. Like, I, I appreciated certain things about it more on repeat viewings, but I understood everything in the movie on the first viewing. Like, by the end of the movie, I had all the answers that I really felt I needed, you know. And, yeah, so the, yeah, the tagline, the full tagline is, question reality. You can go there, even though it doesn't exist. And I'm sort of reading it, I'm, that's, that's sort of the way they say it in the trailer, and that's one of the things 
I think the trailer sold me on the movie. Like, the, the, yeah, this thing of, you know, the, the simulation and then the, the cleverness of you can go to the 13th floor even though it doesn't exist because, yeah. And then you have the, yeah, I mean, some, some parts of the trailer, like, there's this clip of Jane saying to Doug, you can't just keep plugging your brain into this machine and think it's not gonna it's not gonna hurt you or something like that and just the way in 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 the trailer the way it plays it's like this ah, you know kind of thing it, it plays scarier in the trailer than it does in the movie and that is sometimes a thing and yeah so this is IMDb trivia Vincent D'Onofrio said that the theme of the movie was about wanting something that you couldn't have. I think there's a lot of truth to that. And I think that's... It really comes across in his performance, you know, whether... When, both when he's playing Whitney and when he's playing Ashby, you can tell he gets it. He understands exactly what makes this kind of thing work. And that, again, is... The moment that you have this kind of thing, it's like, why aren't you just living your life? Why do you need a simulation? The answer is wanting something you can't have. Hannon wants to go back to his younger days. And, you know, I, I think Whitney in general, he just, the idea of creating something like this, just, he doesn't need it to be a very specific time or something, just the the idea of it you know and and doug also finds it incredible that they've managed to make this thing david wants to keep controlling jane and you know he's he's realizing he's losing her to doug let's see i think that is all i have to add to that i really love this sometimes I, I I don't always agree with every single thing I find in the IMDb goof section, and sometimes I'm like, okay, that's I think you're being a little too harsh on them. Every so often I find something that I just really, really like. The following I really, really like. Incorrectly regarded as goofs. The front page of a newspaper shows the date as Monday, June 21st, 2024. In the year June, in the year 2024, June 21st will fall on a Friday. But since our world is just a simulation, and you can see this newspaper in the real world, it is possible that June 20, 21st, 2024, is a Monday. Beautiful. That I love that because yeah, for most of the movie, you think that. I mean, it's presented as if it's our world, and then at the end of the movie, it's 2024, so 25 years into the future, clearly the thing that we thought was reality was a simulation, so yeah, maybe that's, I, I really love that. Let's see, the... Yeah, I already brought up, uh, you know, we're told that David is, you know, yeah, David is using VR to live out his dark fantasies. We, you know, we're not told if it's in other simulations or if Hall has lots of blackouts that we just don't see. I feel like they would talk about it. Like, when, when... When Doug talks about, I don't remember that, I feel like he or someone else would bring up if it was not the first. It it seems like it's the first time. You know, otherwise they would be like, is it just like the other times it happened? You know, with, with yeah, because when he talks to Hannon about it, he, you know, both of them agree that he's had lots of amnesia, you know, and, and so has Natasha, apparently. But Doug, there's only, yeah, 
basically three times over the course of the movie. At the very start, when Tom Jones liked the singer, but not the singer, and then they're at the end. Now, let's see. And, yeah, so I'm just briefly... The, the, the abridged script is very short, and it was written back when this movie came out. And, you know, today they write a bridge script for movies that came out years ago. And they get much longer and more detailed. You know, for example, the one for Alien. But this one is, is very short. But I just briefly want to say, you know, Craig Bjerko finds blood on the bathroom sink. It has the consistency of gravy. Despite this, he gets stressed and goes to work. And it is kind of like... Yeah, I can't really argue with anything in that. Like the the when he touches the blood, it has the consistency of gravy, and he doesn't like really ask questions. He just gets dressed and goes to work after finding some. Yeah, and let's see. Now, I guess yeah. So from here on out, yeah. So these are the reviews I found via you know this movie's IMDb external reviews section, and yeah. So. There are 99 links in total, and I copied in all that I could, 36. The rest of them are dead links, languages I don't speak, that kind of thing. And let's see. The, the romance with ever so faint echoes of Hitchcock's Vertigo needs a better chemistry set. That's, yeah, well put. He does say that the, the plot is, like, boring. I don't agree with him on that. Or the, the answer to the mystery, something like that. I... The... the I think the ending is unsatisfying, but I... The, the fact that for most of the movie, you know, I'm obviously there are other movies where it turns out that reality is a simulation, and this is not even the only movie where it's only revealed at the very end. But this is a movie where just the ah, I I really like how it handles the the kind of yeah the, the some of the the ethical issues brought up by this sort of thing i do think the ending is unsatisfying and ultimately there is like it it should be ah, what's the word um one second you know ultimately the movie itself doesn't quite it it doesn't have a good answer as to what you know how, how to resolve the ethical issues brought up, but it does a good job of bringing up the ethical issues. I, I really don't agree that this is just, that, that the answer is boring, or that it, you know, obviously it gains a lot by having a sci-fi twist to a film noir story. There are, I could, you know, obviously if I mention titles, if I say, here's the name of a noir movie that has this exact same mystery, then I just spoil that entire thing for you. So I'm not going to do that, but I am going to say there are noir movies out there where at the start, someone important is killed, and, you know, the, the, it turns out that the mist, you know, there is some mystery and someone is out there killing people who know about it, 
and the protagonist comes face to face with the killer in, in some way or another. Now... It turns out, too, that there are limits to the simulation. It has an edge, and people go to it. He tried to kill me, one character says. He found out his world wasn't real. People who don't live in the real world, after all, have nothing to lose. The film was produced by Roland Emmerich, but lacks the wit that he and Dean Devlin brought to Independence Day. This film could have used some of that spark, or at least something like it. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say there's very much about this movie that would be better if it was more similar to Independence Day, but I can't deny that movie has a spark that this doesn't. And let's see. Yeah, I can't really. Right, and so, yeah, yeah, so I can't really talk about movies that have a similar twist since that would be giving away the twist. But yeah, reading this, there's the, the, you know, this movie came out after several others. I think there were, I think it came out as the last one of the three that came out in 99, and there was also at least one from 1997, so this movie is at least the fourth, and in a number of ways, the other movies, not, not in all ways, but the other movies have a stronger final product. You know, I'm I'm not saying that this does nothing that, you know, but the 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 really good stuff in this movie makes it worth watching at least once, but I can't claim that this movie is as good a cohesive product. Ah, sorry, that makes it sound. I don't mean in a. I don't mean product as a negative thing. I mean the the film, the overall film, is better in the cases of the other ones than this. This one has some problems. You can't really, you can't directly, I, I can't recommend this movie to someone without saying there are a few things that you kind of just have to suffer through. And that's, yeah, some of these other movies I have recommended to people with no reservations. And, yeah, I'm just really briefly gonna... This, yeah, so once again, this is one of the external reviews. The, one of the reviews I found via IMDb's external reviews site. External reviews section. Thus, while the basic sci-fi plot is compelling, although the choice of 1930... Uh, yeah. 1937 lacks any historical significance or dramatic bike, its execution and realization is rather flat. In addition, while the story's spin on the old time travel plot prevents many of the but what if they change this or that arguments, it also removes the dangers of one's impact on the past that makes such stories do so interesting. I love time travel stories, but we have tons of them. I honestly don't know that many simulation stories in like in movies. I, I'm sure there are in, in books and such. Especially ones where the simulation turns out that, you know, yeah, it turns out that inside the simulation, the people there have lives and thoughts and dreams outside of the control of the people who made the simulation. These are things and ideas you cannot have in a time travel story. If you travel back in time, you didn't make that. You didn't make their time. 
you know, I, I, I'm sorry, I have to hugely disagree with this person on that. The, the, and it's not like they can't have an impact. I'm sorry, did you miss the part where several people ended up dead? Like, Whitney literally died, and, and, you know, Ashton would have if that was still him in his body. I realize that that's not going to affect the real world. I'm sorry, I'm just, it sounds really callous, dude. Your, your review is making you sound very callous. Um, yeah, that's everything that I had to say about that. Yeah, the, this is a comment on one of the reviews. Like a higher budgeted Outer Limits episode. I'm sorry, I, I'm starting to feel like I was too harsh on the other. I'm just saying I don't, I disagree with them. Let's, let's leave it at that. I don't think they meant to be harsh. Imagine playing a game of Sims by yourself and one day, out of the clear blue, your best friend Sim says, I know what you really are, and shoots your avatar Sim dead. In the 13th floor, your consciousness in is downloaded into the computer. If something or some if someone or something kills your Sim body while you're in it, your mind crashes while without making it back to your real self. You leave behind a living body full of stored memories and nothing active within to retrieve and use them. See, yeah, that they really understand why this is compelling. And the film proposes the question that does reality simply exist because we perceive it as real? And I just wish the rest of the film was as interesting. Even though the 13th floor deals with computers and virtual reality, it seems old and dated. There isn't a single original idea in the film which seems to drag on and on even after it, if it, after it has made its singular point. I'm not sure I would go, go quite that far, but you know, a, a lot of the way, again, I, I, the, the, I'm not saying that it's impossible that it happened on the holodeck but I don't know any other movie where a simulation, like, it really is, no, like, we are, they are essentially real people, you know, the, the, ah, what's it called, you know, they can, they can feel things, and they can dream things that we don't tell them to. I also saw at least one, I forget, it might have been a, um, what's it called, a, rev a, IMDb user review. There we go. I got there eventually. Yeah, at least one IMDb user review that almost seemed offended at the idea that you could create a simulation where they could feel things. You know, he, I think he said something like, you can't feel things without a central nervous system and you can't make that in a computer or something. That's true, but I, I really feel like that's I mean, yeah, that's kind of, you, you have to accept that in order to, to for the movie to, and I, I just, I don't think it, I wouldn't personally give a negative review to something that asked me to suspend my disbelief more than I felt I was willing to. Sometimes to ask interesting questions, you have to propose, you know, what's it called? It's not hypotheses. I forget what it's called, but, you know, propose something that obviously couldn't be real in order to imagine, you know, yeah, in order to process some questions. 
some nice production designs of circa 1930s Los Angeles, some atmospheric, albeit at times underlit, Blade Runner-like shots of the city skyline. Yeah, see, I think probably if you watched all the Star Trek episodes dealing with the holodeck that had come out before this movie, then I think you the, the idea that they have thoughts and dreams and can realize they're in the simulation, can want out of it, I think that might have been on there in at least one of them. So from that perspective, it basically doesn't offer anything new. I just don't think... I don't think it's fair to say that someone should watch all of Star Trek just so they can... I, I mean, I guess, okay, for some of it, you could say, you know, you could recommend very specific episodes to someone so that they could enjoy, but I don't... You can't expect... The, the people who made this movie weren't expecting, like, people... Like, uh, what's it called? One second, I know it's just my tongue. The people who made this movie weren't expecting all the people who would go watch the movie to have watched those episodes. You know, I I don't think you should have to like there there are things that you know the Star Trek shows do that no movie can do. So I don't think you know you're you're not like robbing like if I had watched I did, actually. I did watch this before I watched those, you know, the, I hadn't watched any Star Trek by the time I watched this the first time, so I still enjoyed those episodes. Anyway, I think I'm getting into the weeds. And yeah, so from here on out, IMDB user reviews, and I copied in the 100, the, the 100 voted most useful out of there are 334 total which it's wild way more people need to see this movie even even if they end up not liking it at least more than 334 should want to comment on it i feel like anyway like there are some new movies that have thousands of reviews and some of the new movies aren't even that good it's just you know everyone yeah anyway Let's see the um, yeah, so I'm just going to Yeah, so I'm going to try to avoid... Hmm. Fans of David Lynch will not be disappointed either. If you're a great fan of Lynch, then you will see this as an easy-to-follow film that has some nice turns and twists without forcing you to pause and rewind or watch again. And that's very true. I, I don't think... David Lynch is an unbelievably talented filmmaker. His movies aren't really for me. But I definitely, I've, I've, ah, it's not a huge deal and I'm almost done with the video. I'm just briefly going to say, I've seen enough Lynch to agree with that statement, to understand it and agree with it. Yeah, his movies are definitely harder to follow than this. And are meant to be. This is not meant to be. You know, I, I, um, was it Movie Bob or someone who called WandaVision Baby's First Lynch or something like that? And, and yeah, you could, well, that is substantially more Lynchian than this is, but yeah. And... Movie touches 
upon ideas about creation and living in a virtual world, how it could impact you, how power makes you ill and crazy, and you start to destroy your creation. Okay, so almost... Huh. There was one really cool thing that I noticed. The same song that the band is playing in a 30s scene is again played by a live band in a 90s scene when Virgo and Mo are dancing. Yeah, yeah. That is... I... I... I was sitting there like, is that the same? And yeah, it is. It's true. And in both cases, it's a live band. So that is quite, yeah. If you've played The Sims, then this movie might make you think again. What if the game you were playing was with real people? Who are the real people? This is a layer cake of a movie. The imagery in this movie is stunning the 1930s LA a visual feast. Love the sepia tinting of these sequences passed off in the movie as a software fault that needed work. The plot is straightforward for the first two thirds of the movie, but then it accelerates and goes into left field. I thought the ending was acceptable. Indeed, I thought the colors in the ending suggested that that, I'm sorry, that suggested that this was another level in another level to virtual reality, which left a pleasant taste, as it were, in my intellectual mouth. Best visual effect? The edge of the world. Quantum leap. And yeah, that's very true. It's very quantum leap. Actually, I guess that's maybe another reason why people are like, this offers no new ideas. I haven't watched quantum leap, but I do know the concept. And yeah, there's obviously Quantum Leap was a was a TV show that did the thing of jumping into someone else's body before this movie came out. But I I'm pretty sure Quantum Leap was preceded by the novel, possibly also by the miniseries. Now let's see. There was, but but yeah, I agree. You know, the the ending makes it seem like, yeah, it is another level to, and and then. It shuts off with the simulation shut down effect. So, yeah. Now, let's see. Yeah, so this guy says, you know, the that it's interesting, you know, he says, we've seen before the <clears throat> multiple levels of reality. And he says the what it does new is give the simulacrum a soul, and let's see. now. But but yeah, now that I can talk, you know, in the in the review, I talk about how in nineteen sorry. <clears throat> In 999, it was, people were thinking about the end of the world as in Ragnarok. But in 1999, you know, we thought about, well, what if reality is a simulation? And I couldn't say in the review, but I can now, that is a different end of the world. You know, a, a physical limitation, which, you know, people used to think that the world was flat. And I read somewhere online, it can't be... Because if it was, cats would have knocked everything off it by now. And, I mean, checkmate. But the, the, um, let's see. What was it? The, um, ah. 
I also saw someone say they're not a member of the Flat Earth Society, but the Cat Earth Society, and they had drawn like a boundary around various, uh, like uh, all the all the different countries of the world, and it looks like a cat playing with a ball of yarn. So that's also the, but anyway, yeah, you know the the end of the world as a kind of yeah. Um, almost done. Let's see. Let's see. Right, here's uh, someone who actually says they use the movie as an example teaching about theoretical computer science to non-technical people. And, yeah, the, the... Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm just gonna, you know, I, I think that review is worth reading. I just really want to read aloud that... Let's see. The, yeah, the 2030s is the only one believable, but even it seems a little fishy because it lays on affects others left out too thickly, like the smog mist is far too dense for that part of L.A. Let's, and see. So, uh, let's see. Yeah, and, and I thought this was a good point as well. Unfortunately, sci-fi is often branded as action-slash-adventure, and the few attempts to sidestep the popular mode mold get miscast and thrown aside for being slow and boring. And it's it's very true. It's it's It really sucks that so many people think that if it's sci-fi, there must be, like, big, you know, this is a sci-fi movie, but not in the sense that there's like spaceships and time travel and such, you know, the, the, let's see, laser guns and such, you know, and it, it is, it is really unfortunate because it is too low key for a lot of people, especially by the time it came out. And I will just very briefly, I have reached the end of my notes. I'm almost certain there's nothing more I want to say. And I think I am also, yeah, time-wise. So I'm just briefly, let's see. Yeah, I just briefly want to say the, the DVD cover features the, uh, what's it called, the, the 3D grid. And yeah, so I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time.